So I wanted to get a little deeper into kind of the arithmetic of the title, which is Jews Don't Count, which I definitely agree with. But I think there's a bit more sophisticated math we can do. So it's like Jews don't count as a rule. But then it almost seems to me that Jews, particular kinds of Jews, count less than other Jews. And I'm thinking right now about, you know, the outpouring in my community after the attack on the synagogue where I became a bat mitzvah, tree of life, three years ago versus the attacks on ultra-Orthodox or Haredi Jews in Brooklyn. And then there's another layer of math, which is you count less or more depending on who's attacking you. If it's a neo-Nazi that's attacking you, um, you're kind of a pure victim. But if it's another, if you get attacked from a group that is uh, understood and, and rightly understood to be another victim or minority group, it mm. seems to that that death or that assault or that harassment seems to count less. Yeah, I agree I with that. To, yeah, can you describe why that is? Well, I think it's to do with the hierarchy of racism and fear, isn't it? It's to do with fear of getting it wrong, uh, that somehow or other, you know, that the the people who want to ascribe sympathy and allyship are confused by the idea that you know one minority might be attacking another. Uh, and they want boundaries to be clear there in terms of how they ascribe their allyship. And certainly you're right that you, you'll, you might have to help me with the facts here. But when uh, that group that calls itself the real Hebrews, is it? it yes. Sort of, uh, yeah. The, the black Hebrews. Yeah. The, 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 they, they attacked a, a Brooklyn deli. That's uh, right. That's right. Now, I didn't see much outcry about that compared to the outcry that did happen during the Pittsburgh thing, right, which was a neo-Nazi. Having said that, I talk a lot in the book about a liberal Democrat, or used to be a liberal Democrat, so some a progressive person became a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn during, during Jeremy Corbyn's time called Jenny Tong, who as soon as the Pittsburgh thing happened, posted something on Facebook about how, you know, why don't this is terrible but why don't people realize that the way the netanyahu government act will lead to things like this blah 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 without realizing that the guy had nothing to do with that it was just an immediate reaction and that comes from something very very deep i think i mean she's a anti-semite but which is the notion that jews are always in some way responsible for their suffering Jew, this is again a very deeply held myth about Jews. I talk in the book about how Roald Dahl uh, said, you know, that um, even a stinker like Hitler didn't do it for no reason. And earlier on, he said something about how there's something in the Jewish character that always creates antipathy. And this sort of it, it, this idea that anti-Semites have that there is an eternal condition of being Jewish. The e eternality is very important, I think, in that anti-Semitism that inspires people to kill them. And that somehow or other that is the responsibility of, of the Jew. Now, that doesn't completely answer your question, but I'm, all I'm saying is that even with the Pittsburgh thing, I quickly saw essentially people who would consider themselves to be progressive somehow saying that the Jews were at least semi-responsible for, for that. But I would agree with you definitely that Islamist attacks on Jews are less condemned than Nazi attacks. And that Black Hebrews thing, about which I don't want to speak too much because I don't know that much about it. Yeah. But but I would imagine I didn't I just didn't hear that much about it. So that seems to me to follow what you're saying. But yeah, I mean that's straightforwardly because within the progressive <laughs> mindset, there's a confusion about about that calling out and that minority. Right. And I guess I would say, like, is it a confusion or is it an natural logical outgrowth of the nature of the worldview if the worldview says who like your claim to being a victim your claim to being protected your claim to sympathy and empathy and compassion is dependent on group belonging rather than who you are as an individual and everyone as an individual is, should be accorded the exact same empathy compassion etc it's a it's a view about looking at people based on group rights or group identity versus looking at people based on the who they are as individuals. And I would suggest that Jewish history has a very clear and tragic answer about where ideologies like that ultimately lead to. Yeah. Well, I, well, I would also say that you know there's a very deep emphasis on a, a sort of economic idea in the way that people think about all this. So the idea of structural racism, which I 
think exists. I don't dis disavow that it exists and that, you know, there are issues in terms of like the economic disparities. Nonetheless, what you get is this weird thing whereby the idea of economic disparity will lead to the ignoring of, say, hate crime, or at least the tempering of responses to hate crime, by which I mean the idea, which is a myth, and essentially a racist myth that Jews are rich and that Jews are more economically secure than other minorities tempers, I think, the response to Jewish hate crime, because it has within it the sense that Jews are somehow OK. And these are people who are less you know, well off than Jews who are hitting back, punching up. I mean, really, it's the same thing as the idea of like, you know, anti-Semitism is somehow punching up. Um, I mean, similarly, there's a bit in the book where I talk about a close friend of mine who's a very progressive person I did this campaign about 10 years ago in Britain to try and raise awareness that there was very bad anti-semitic chanting at football matches and it was based around what I called the y word and I deliberately called it the y word it's I'm going to say it's the word yid but I called it the y word really because I was making an intellectual point which is you know why is this word not blanked out in the same way as these other words that that we do blank out uh, and he said to me at one point, well, this film that you made suggests, and that film had black footballers and brown footballers in it talking about it, but it suggests that, you know, the N word and the P word, uh, that the Y word is as bad as those words. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, it's not as bad. And I said, why not? And he said, because Jews are rich, which sort of is amazing. It's amazing that he sort of breezily and casually just said that as a, as a truism. But also, what's he saying there? He's saying that aggression and assault and, you know, proper terrible stuff that can happen to Jews because it is properly terrible as a Jew to sit in a football stadium and hear people chanting fuck off yids fuck off yids over and over again is somehow mitigated by economic security and a it's not and b down the line it leads to what happens to my grandparents which are they were rich as it happens they lived in Königsberg in Germany and all their family was murdered uh, and so that's the point. My point is that that kind of notion, which I think is really at the heart of what you're saying, which is, well, there are economic disparities that override all these things. And that's really what we have to think about is what are the economic disparities that different minorities are set in and Jews don't suffer from that. Therefore, we don't have to worry about all this stuff. And we do. I was struck in the book, you have a little footnote where you talk about, um, and you, you write about this in general in the book, um, where you make a distinction between the kind of brash and bold and unapologetic American Jewish sort of architect right. versus like the quietest British, yeah. you know, um, you know, self-deprecating one. Yeah. And I, I have to say, like, I very much grew up with that impression as well. But that really changed for me watching the pushback against Corbyn and Corbynism, in which I really felt like, you know, British Jewry kind of came out in a more powerful way than I ever would have expected. Um, and I'm wondering if that made you revise your sense of that dichotomy. Um, a bit. I mean, as I say in the book, you know, towards the end of it, I say things are changing and that that reserve uh, on the part of British Jewry, that passivity and that failure to sort of see themselves as a minority that suffer racism that therefore might need to speak out and do something has yeah, that's the first time I ever saw it in my you know whole life there's a bit in the book where I talk about the Jewish Chronicle which is you know the newspaper for Jews here or there, are, there are some others but it's the main one and someone once said to me their headline every week isn't it is basically they hate us and I said no it's they hate us and let's not make a fuss about it <laughs> that was how I grew up really but yeah, yeah no Jews did make a fuss about it and uh, I think that was mobilizing and interesting or whatever I would say that it still came with a lot of agony, especially for left-wing Jews, which, uh, you know, some of whom obviously stuck with Corbyn and believed it was all smears and all that. But I'm talking about the ones who came out uh, against him. There was a lot of agony about it. I'll give you a, a, a sort of a relevant thing, I think. So I did a panel quite recently with a group of young Jewish comedians, most of whom, because I'm an old man of British comedy, I <laughs> didn't really know about them, but they were all really nice. And they talked about anti-Semitism on the cabaret circuit and stuff. Uh, that, and some of it was kind of breathtaking. And obviously on the London or British comedy circuit, these are all progressives Can that we're talking a, about. Give us an example or two, just so we oh, Well, one of them, I mean, just amazing stuff. Like one woman saying of this 
photographer who was coming to photograph her for her Edinburgh show. And again, the photographer's kind of an artist and a very sort of progressive guy or whatever, saying, oh, I thought you'd have a bigger nose. And I'd sort of set up the camera on the basis that I thought you'd have a bigger nose. Your face is like Oprah on that Megan thing. But that's no, how I felt. No, hold on. What? Yeah, it's like, what? what? <laughs> Can we roll back here? Yeah, but she said well, that. let's be clear. They did rehearse that conversation and we did not. <laughs> Well, because yeah, we, we don't live in Montecito as as uh you know in in, in mansions next to one another, unfortunately. But okay. yes, that is shocking. I mean, that's shocking. Yeah, to but me. I mean, a, a sort of more interesting example in a way was another one talked to me about how. Uh, so a gay comedian said to her at one point, "I'm going to vote for Corbyn. I know he's anti-Semitic," he said, "but I think he's great for gay people." And the Jewish woman comedian said, "Okay, that really upsets me," and he got really angry and said, you don't understand the kind of trauma I have to suffer and you don't understand being shouted at the street for being gay and blah, blah, blah. And she said, oh, I know. And at that point I interrupted her and said, no, you should have said, fuck you. Fuck you, because Jews do suffer all that stuff. And you need to, that's where you need to own it. You need to own the fact that being a Jew involves an incredible history of trauma and damage and all the rest of it and being told by another minority who have suffered that stuff totally but being told that you don't is something Jews need to not be so nervous about saying and that comes back to what you said about the Corbyn thing which is I still perceive this incredible nervousness with Jews for saying no we do we do suffer racism and it's a thing and we're going to talk about it. But is maybe the problem, and to put kind of our side broadly on the hook, is the problem with Jews or is the problem with progressive Jews who are hand-wringing and scared of being cast out of their assumed political home, the dinner parties they like to go to, the places, the things they like to read, the plays they like to go to, if they were to forcefully stand up against this? I mean, right, that's kind of what's at stake hmm. in my mind. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I've written this book um, and it is a critique of progressives. And, uh, well, you know, it's hard to tell in coronavirus how many dinner parties I've not been invited to. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I guess that might happen. I, I don't know. Yeah, but, maybe. But if you were to come out and say more explicitly, um, yeah, this ideology is just a dead end, not just for Jews, but for everyone. And we should reject it. I, I don't, I think we disagree on that. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's a dead end. I think it's flawed and needs critiquing. I don't agree that, you know, all forms of trying to understand uh, how I, how identity functions in culture and also how subconsciously, you know, there may be types of power structures that do are affected by the colour of person, the person's skin or by whatever oh. sexuality they have. I think that exists. Oh, if that, you'll brook no disagreement from me on that. I 100% agree with you. But that but is I, what identity politics is at some level. No, isn't it? I think what, what you describe in the book, I think extremely effectively, is there's good identity politics and there's bad identity politics. Okay, that, well, that I would agree with. Good identity politics is saying, yeah, we all have a different experience. Of course, the person who's walking down the street in my neighborhood with black skin is experiencing it different from me, who's walking down the street with my girlfriend, holding my hand, who's different yeah. from me. It goes without saying. What I think good identity politics says is, let me explain to you my experience and let's figure out how to make things fairer for all of us. Mm -hmm. What bad identity politics says, and I think the bad kind is what you're really accurately describing here, is a kind that says we're all locked in in a kind of very um, ironclad way to the circumstances of our birth. Mm. And not only is there no um, reason that we should try and understand one another because you can never really understand me and my lived experience, but in fact, we're all slotted in, in this pyramid, this new caste system, let's call yeah, it. I agree with that. I think that That's is bad. But I would also say something else, which I think is bad, uh, which I think is not all of it, but quite a lot of this, I would say, does come from, and it's interesting, this is sort of an identity politics idea in my head, from white guilt, right? So I think a lot of the people, and certainly a lot of the people who troll me on Twitter or whatever about all this stuff are just, you know, they are that enemy. They're white heterosexual men most of the time, desperately trying to show solidarity as they see it <laughs> with black people or with gay people or whatever else it might be. And that seems to me to be, a lot of where the hair trigger stuff comes from, it's like those people desperately trying to show that they are, you know, 
behind whoever it might be very rarely Jews but right right and that's part of the issue but, but, right but I think the reason that they are incentivized to do that is because they understand that in order to cover their own ass they have to genuflect to this thing even more so than someone that has any kind of minority identity because you know as a straight white you have a funny line in here where you're describing a reviewer who you know waves away uh i think it was a movie or a tv show it as and kind it, it, it's charlie coffman's book and kind and, right. uh, and she describes the character in it as cis white heterosexual male blah 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 and the character is unbelievably jewish in my eyes uh, i mean it's complicated because it's charlie kaufman and at one and the character continually denies being jewish but he's really i mean his name is b rosenberger rosenberg right <laughs> and and the play that, that he's doing all the time with the guy being a self-loathing jew who won't come out as you is so obvious to me and that's part of it again. It's like, I've, you know, that reviewer who has got in touch with me and is incredibly nice, and I feel a bit bad about it now uh, in a slightly Jewish way, saying, oh, she, you know, that's not how she feels about it, but she really understands the importance of the book and whatever. But at some point, at some level, for me, it was just about like a Jew reading this book. It's so obvious the character is Jewish in a fucked up way. And that's just not in your review because your review is about, you know, how it's essentially a white straight man and therefore he's kind of hateful, right? And so that's just missed out. There's just no conversation about it. And I'm interested in, as I start the book, with saying, how does his, how would his Jewishness, if you did understand that, how would that play with your under, with your feeling like this is a person of power and therefore not important? Um, what do you want people to come away with this book having learned? Uh, and also maybe, how do you want it to change people's perspectives? And maybe your answer will be, I'm not a strategist. And yeah. well, it is, know, that is sort my answer, but not. But there's obviously a reason that you wrote this book. Yeah, not completely, because I think I believe in the power of just shining a light on things that people haven't thought about as an agent of change. Now, I, I literally, and I'm not just trying to get out of what you're, you know, are you trying to pin me down here? It is true that I don't know what that change exactly should be or what it might be. And certainly I think, you know, the world is so screwed up now that I don't think there will be any easy progress to any change anyway. But there is, with, unquestionably, people have read this book. Well, it's had three reactions, okay? The third one is kind of the one we're talking about, but I'll say the other two, right? Jews, primarily, British Jews, primarily have said, oh, someone has at last said the things that we've been thinking about progressive, thinking about Jews for the last sort of, certainly... 10 years but probably longer here it is in a neat package there's a, also a small section of jews who have said because i talked a little bit about jewish shame in the book and about jews not really wanting to talk about their own jewish as well but who come out to me sort of on twitter and said i am jewish i've never really talked about it before i've read your book and now i'm gonna try and understand and own it a bit more which is actually i find kind of heartbreaking and quite nice and then the third one is progressives saying i get it now i sort of didn't really get it when because I had it a lot, you know, I had, I know a lot of left-wing people, I'm a comedian, and I had comedians, left-wing comedians texting me during the Corbyn years saying, but we're left-wing, how can we possibly be racist? I mean, that in its very boiled down banality is sort of at the heart of the confusion, right? And I would try and explain it to them, but this book explains it better. And just that fact of explanation and of people reading it and thinking, oh, I get that now, I get how maybe that's offensive to Jews, I didn't really even see that before, that seems an advance to me that people would hold that in their minds. But I, I honestly can't say where I think it will lead to beyond that understanding. Um, first of all, thank you all for for joining us, watching. It's hard not to see an audience, but yeah. I see you guys are asking questions in the Q&A. Um, and please uh, send any questions there. I'm going to grab a few from here. Um, 